I'm going to pretend to believe in myself. I'm going to fake it until I make it. The new business I started Simply Be and making money felt powerful, got a book deal felt important, got a platform felt special. And it's just this constant outsourcing. It almost killed me. That's no joke. I was going to say I sold it seven years later after blood and sweat and tears and grind and diagnosed burnout and depression and hustle. There was a deep lack of authenticity. And I don't think that that's sustainable. I do believe in the power of leaping and then knowing the net's going to catch you in an energetic frequency, vibrational capacity and choice. Like you will crash the car at some point if you are living out of alignment. You grew up outside of Chicago. Yeah. You said it was in the book, it was a Jewish suburb. Yeah. Which is a part of your core identity. And yeah. you have a brother, Doug, you have parents, Ron and Suzanne, right? Or Susan? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what was that like growing up in the the Jewish suburb of Chicago mm. um, in those early, early days? What do you remember your parents mm. indoctrinating you all to, to understand about the world and yeah. that kind of shaped your, your path, you know, mm. leaving the house later on? Beautiful question. So where I grew up was a very uh, affluent community, very mm -hmm. wealthy. wealthy. Which suburb it's called was the this, by the way? Highland Park. Highland Park. Okay, that's where they Highland shot Park. those breakfast, those Brat Pack movies and yep. stuff. Right? Yep. The yeah. North Shore of Chicago is like an iconic. Yeah. It's a breakfast bunch of Club was that yep. in Highland Park? Breakfast Club. Did you go to that high school. I I went to. I did not go to that high school. It's another high school close to that neighborhood. It's all like Deerfield. Ferris Bueller. Uh -huh. Ferris Bueller was shot in Highland Park. Yes. Nice. Yes. Home Alone. Home Alone was shot down like down the way in a town <laughs> called Wilmette, which is right by my house. Like the North Shore of Chicago is um, very wealthy, not entirely predominantly Jewish. Parts of it are. Um, and where I grew up was. And I was, you know, from – as long as I can remember, just surrounded in affluence. And my parents were self-made people. And I remember one of the most formative conversations or moments with my mother. I was in her station wagon beaver car sitting in the back seat with my little brother. And my mom, you know, she was like driving the steering wheel, my brother and I were in the back. And I, my brother goes, mom, 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 look at all these big houses. Look at that big house and look at that big house. Because, you know, we were old enough at the time, like probably three, four, five, able to see the world around us. And I'll never forget my mom was just driving the front. She leans her head back behind her shoulder and is like, you know, Doug, it's not the houses that matter. It's the people who live in those houses that matter. That's, that's, that's what's really what we should be considering to be impressive or the, you know, the, the, the hearts and souls of the people. And my mom and my dad really did a beautiful job raising us with perspective, um, but they weren't perfect, like no family is. And because I was, you know, gawky, I never really felt like I fit in. I really believe I'm a star seed, meaning I don't really believe I'm truly from this planet. So I had a big struggle with belonging a lot of my life. I was not ever in the popular crowd. I had a lot of unfortunate you know, dysfunction at home that played itself out in my own securities at, at school. Um, boys were mean to me. The girls were meaner. Um, I'm not in any way saying I'm a, you know, I look back on that sweet little girl and she was really just trying, trying to find her way. But um, being sort of an outcast, if you will, or, you know, not really always feeling like I belonged in this world that seemed to have, where everyone seemed to have a perfect family and a perfect home and a perfect body. And, you know, my mom shopped at TJ Maxx while my classmates were like rocking Chanel bags and Kate Spade. Like, you know, it was just like that. And um, I'm grateful for my parents though, because they raised me, although it was very dysfunctional at times, um, with a lot of moral integrity and a lot of love. And I look at my brother, how he's turned out, and 
how I've turned out. I think they did a great job, even though it was painful along the way in certain points. So I don't want to turn the audience against your dad, but, but you mentioned this in your book, so I want to ask you about it. Jessica yeah. Zero. Yeah. What what prompted him to call you that? Was he being silly or was he being serious? And how did that affect, how did that impact your, your teenage years? <sighs> that impacted my whole life, um, that statement. He was not being silly. Um, you know, to be honest, that chapter in this book has caused, a, um, fortunate, a lot of um, rec reconciling now in my 40s. Um, he, you know, he offered a lot of grace at the same time by not asking me to delete that sentence or change it. Um, he probably doesn't like, remember it, right? He doesn't remember it. He doesn't remember it. And the... My, my dad experienced real trauma. Like, not that I didn't, not that, you know, there's a spectrum of trauma, of course, but my dad had, uh, he came from parents who had zero tools and he was, you know, traumatized from that. And so when I came out into the world, as what I say in the book, his only, first and only spitfire of a daughter with a bunch of rebellious hormones by the time I turned like 12 through about 19, uh, we really clashed and he didn't have the consciousness that I needed him to have to raise me with the like tenderness and compassion. It was, it turned into a lot of anger. Um, and there was a particular fight that we got into where I was being defiant. And he said to me, I am going to call you Jessica Zero because you're going to amount to nothing. And that one statement drove my entire professional and personal life from that moment forward until recently. Like all I've ever wanted to do underneath all of my accolades of all of my success of all of the sparkly shit I've accumulated in my life, like at the core, and I've done a lot of work with my own healers and therapists to understand that this is, this is why I just wanted to make my dad proud of me and prove him wrong. And, um, I've really gone through the portal of alchemizing that, you know, it led me to a really dark place. It's actually where I started writing the book from a point of burnout, but I really am very clear that my relationship with my father is, my greatest spiritual teacher. Um, and I'm very blessed that he's my dad. Um, because despite the pain, there was a tremendous amount of love that I did get from him, which makes it so complex, right? Like our parents form us in the sense of they're the people we come out of the womb loving the most. And ironically, they're the ones that hurt us the most. And it is that dichotomy that literally shapes us and forms who we are on so many levels. And so I'm a little tender right now if I'm going to be honest talking about that chapter because um, I've just had some tough conversations with my dad recently as the book gets closer and it's become a little contentious, frankly. And, um, and yet I believe, and thank you for giving me the space to talk about this because I really believe this to be true that I didn't write that chapter in this like 3D identity for a book. I feel like my higher self channeled that chapter onto the paper so that I could reconcile a, a lineage of, of trauma. And whether it's my dad who can receive and alchemize that in this lifetime, I know that that's what really was in was the intention and why that came through and the, and the invitation that it offered for my dad to really move through a lot of the pain that we both, I guess, experienced when, when he was raising me. And I hope most of all that it's going to help a lot of people who read the book um, as well. So it's, you know, it's not just about me. The whole book isn't about me. The whole book is a, hopefully a mirror for the person reading it. 
Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it, I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right, thank you so much for helping out, and back to the show. Yeah, no, it's interesting being an author. You know, I haven't, your book is much more of a memoir than anything I've written before. And so you share a lot. You share a lot. And um, I'm sure it's really interesting. It's a process and just to decide what you want to keep in versus what you want to take out, especially if you're painting a picture of, of other people, other figures in from your history. Yeah. And, um, that I'm, I'm yeah. curious just what that internal process was for you, for people who want to be honest, want to mm -hmm. tell the truth, but then you encounter people with different memories of the truth. And how do you, how do you kind of navigate that? It's a beautiful question. I mean, I, I write about my husband in the book. I write about my best friend in the book. I yeah. write about my medicine healer. Does your husband, does your husband, is he upset with the whole scare? No, he's, he, he's cool. He, he, yeah. I, he's, he agrees that he's in scarcity sometimes. Yes. He's been, th he's been through the whole book. We've, he's amazing, you know, very different than like my father. Um, I write about how I went to therapy with my best friend. You know, I've, I write about, um, my body dysmorphia, like there's a whole bunch of, you know, aspects that are very raw, very naked that I had to, had to address the people in my life. And that's one of the biggest points of the book is where our light gets the most tested, where we find the most polarity and, and struggle is in relationship, right? With other people. And so it's a, it's a really good question, like, because I learned, um, for my first book be, you know, that I have to, I went to Pat, my mentor, the woman that I speak about at the end of the book, like I asked permission for every single person to use their name, to tell their story. If they didn't want me to use their name, I changed their name. The situation with my dad was the most uh, delicate slash kryptonite. <laughs> and, um, you know, if I'm going to be in the deepest service to my father, he, you know, when he first read the first version of that chapter, he was so hurt, not because of the things that I said about him that were negative, but that I didn't paint a full 360 picture of the good of which there, of which there was much good and love and how much he fiercely tried to be the best father he could be. And I offer that to your, your listeners who might, you know, like me, this has been, so, it's such a, it's been a quantum leap in like healing my relationship with my father in this last year, writing this book to not just see our parents in the lens of like how they hurt us, but truly their humanity and how much they, they loved us and did the best with what they had. And uh, that was my father's biggest complaint, if you will, was that it didn't really show the full breadth of his fatherhood. And he was right about that, actually. And I mean, the book is not about his, you know, how he was a father. It was about you and your own process. And I know, that. you know, my, we have a tradition in my family where we, we get on a zoom call for everyone's birthday and we reflect on memories. And when my mom's birthday rolled around, I have three brothers. All of us, all we talked about in a very lighthearted way was the times we got spanked because she would spank us in the most creative ways. <laughs> and it was, I kind of made a mental note of that. It was like, oh my God, it's all like trauma, trauma stories. Yeah. That's what you remember. As, as a kid, you don't really appreciate all the good. You just remember the times that people hurt you. And you remember shit like, oh, I ran away when I was 16 years old. So. Yeah. Talk about that. You didn't believe in yourself. You ran away. Hmm. You ran out of your big house to someone else's big house, or what? we didn't live in that big of a house. Well, you didn't have one of those no. We, my parents live in the same house I grew up in. It's a very modest, small house. I, uh -huh. I give them a lot of credit. They've saved their money well. But my mom um, and dad had a fight one night. 
typical. I was 16. Um, I was a thespian in my high school. I was part of the theater department and I had a best friend and he was my gay male best friend and he was my only friend. And he kind of knew that there was some struggles at home, but not really. And um, I ran, I ran out of the house in the midst of the fray. And I remember running to the downtown area of my home. So it was like, I don't know, like a 20 minute walk to get to a payphone. This was in like, I don't know, the nineties, right? There was no cell phones. And I just knew the grocery store had a, a, a payphone. And so that's where I went and I called Brett. I actually remember asking the guy behind the checkout cashier counter for a quarter because I didn't have any money. And uh, I called my friend Brett and I was hysterically crying and he just came and he picked me up. And Brett lived with his single mom, Pat. And Pat um, was, you know, independent. She was sort of witchy. She had been divorced from her husband or ex-husband for quite some time. And, and her home was like this portal. Her home was this world of like magic. And she had, you know, crystals everywhere and beautiful artwork everywhere. And she was so fully expressed and images of her girlfriends traveling the world on her wall. I'm like, who is this woman who is single? She ran her own business. She had a stationary company. She was empowered. She was awake. And I stayed with her for two weeks. And that experience opened my eyes to the power of like mentorship and what it's like to really be activated by somebody who isn't your parent, who isn't necessarily even a professional mentor, but somebody who gives you the gift of what's possible simply by witnessing how they live their lives. And I felt so safe with her and so seen by her. And she, um, she had like angel card decks. She had like runic stones. She had all of these like magical tools that again, I had never seen before. And I really feel in, in so many ways that I am the woman I am today because of her influence. She just opened my eyes to the world of feminine energy and spirit and, uh, you know, I really am very grateful for that experience. And I, I went home to my parents' house two weeks later, a different person. Did she, did Pat home. negotiate that two week sabbatical with your parents like right away? Or does she kind of play into the whole, Hey, you're, you're running away thing or how did that all go that's down? That's a really I'm good sure your question. Parents would have gone crazy with you. Yeah. I, you know, gosh, that's a good question. I didn't, I think I, I was the one really leading the ship. I think I was the one that was pretty defiant and clear. I mean, I was 16. I wasn't like super young, but I didn't want to come home yet. And Pat was sort of the conduit and safe space, but I don't recall her getting involved too deeply. Uh, I think she really was there to just hold me and protect me for as long as I needed her to. And when I was ready, um, because my parents did want me to come home. I remember they kept, you know, begging, asking, getting frustrated. I wasn't. Um, and she didn't meddle. I don't remember Pat meddling in that. I think she really just allowed me to work out my own stuff with my parents and with myself. And she was just a container. Okay. So give us a little bit of a montage of what happens next. You go to University of Illinois, you have body dysmorphia, you fall out of love with theater and into love with entre entrepreneurship. Just take us through like your your fashion blog that you started. I'm smiling so hard because you read every word of my book, Light, <laughs> and I'm grateful. Uh, yeah, I graduated high school. I went to college for theater. I loved the theater. I was actually quite good at acting. I got a gold star in sword fighting. I learned all the dialects. I got classically trained at this college program I went to at U of I. Um, I also gained a lot of weight <laughs> as college girls do from the beer and the pizza. And yet I was talented and I got an agent right away. And as soon as I started getting put onto audition, the audition circuit with casting directors, I was 
immediately told that I needed to lose weight. And I had never really had my body, you know, be such a forward focal confronting issue in my life until then. And those conversations, those reflections of like casting directors literally telling me I needed to lose 25 pounds if I ever wanted to be an actress, um, sent me deep on a body dysmorphic, uh, orthorexia sometimes and like purging, binging the whole thing, um, for about eight years. Um, I lost so much weight. I didn't get my period for two years, uh, cause I was so underweight and, Meanwhile, I was, you know, hustling the acting life, waitressing, nannying, temp jobbing, you know, trying to make it as an artist, fell in love with a, a much older man in my 20s and went into a deeply addictive codependent relationship. And it wasn't until my late 20s that I um, got the spark to start my own business, which I didn't even really know I was becoming an entrepreneur at the time. I just really loved food, fashion. I loved writing. I've always been a writer at heart, even more so, I think, than an actor. And I got this download to start an online food and fashion blog for the women of the city of Chicago. And it was like within a minute of, you know, that download, I basically quit acting. I quit the boyfriend. That was very painful. Um, and started sort of, this was around age 28 to 30. And I don't know if you're familiar with your Saturn return, but this is a astrological cycle. A lot of a lot of women understand what this is. 28 to 30 is really when you, and it's, it's for anybody, it's for any, any human at that mark, it's Saturn returns back around the sun based on the rotation of it every 28 to 30, 30 years. And it's a hugely sort of transformational, disruptive, al alchemizing time of your life where like everything kind of changes, including your identity. And so that was the dawn of my entrepreneurial career. Um, said goodbye to acting, never looked back and began pursuing the world of social media and content creation and marketing and branding and was really, you know, like I, I picked it up real fast. I was like, oh, Facebook, it's just another stage, <laughs> except I get to play myself now, you know, and um, really like got good at C communicating there and creating audience and c connection and conversion. And that magazine did really well critically. I ran this platform for seven years called cheekychicago.com, cheek with a Y. We were the girl's go-to guide from 2008 to 2014 in Chi-Town. Huge following. Um, but that business left me broke at the end of it. Broke as a joke on my knees with financial scarcity, literally actual financial scarcity. Like I had no money and um, took a corporate job for two years to sort of lick my wounds and pay off my debt. And then got the crazy idea to start another business like, like the lunatics we are as entrepreneurs, rub some nickels together and started Simply Be. Okay. Before we get into that. Yeah. There's a conversation you had with one of your acting, I think, teachers um, about believing in yourself. So I want you to take us back to that moment. And then I want you to talk about what is how, how did you embody that? Because I think that's something people hear all the time. You got to believe in yourself. Right. Yeah. How do you start believing in yourself? And did that translate to Cheeky Chicago? And was that one of the reasons why it was successful? And then why did you go broke? Mm. Mm. So I'll start with the acting teacher comment. Um, back to my high school days, I always loved theater. Before I went to college for it, I was in the acting department in high school. And I wasn't getting cast in any lead parts. I wasn't even getting supporting roles. I was always ensemble and I was pissed. I was frustrated and was ready to quit the department. And I went into my acting teacher's office crying, telling him how sad and upset I was. And he was like, Jessica, you're not getting cast because you're not talented. You are talented. The reason why you're not getting cast is because it's evident you don't believe in yourself. And that's one of my favorite parts of the book, if I'm going to be honest, when I really tell that story, I call it chasing the spiral of worth. And it was from that moment, I was like, okay, well, if that's the case, I'm going to pretend to believe in myself. I'm going to fake it until I make it. And I got really good at faking it. 
until I did make it. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to fake it so hard that I believe in myself. And I got the leading role in the next year. I got into the most, one of the most competitive acting departments in college. I started getting the roles out of college, lost the weight, whatever, got cat, met a boyfriend, felt beautiful, felt successful, quit the boyfriend, quit the acting group, felt free, started, you know, the, um, the new business I started simply be and started making money, felt powerful, got a book deal, felt important, you know, got a platform, felt special. And it's just this constant outsourcing. And, you know, to answer your question on why I went broke, I mean, we, we were just bad at managing money in that business, frankly. Um, but there was a lack of integration. There really was. There was a when I say lack of integration, like who we were painting ourselves to be as a business was very different than the what was going on inside. There was a deep lack of authenticity. And I don't think that that's sustainable. Like you will crash the car at some point if you are living out of alignment. And that's what happened really ultimately with that business, I think on a 3D level and a, and a cosmic level. And so I was writing this book, The Light Work, after my real apex of my burnout breakdown. I had just come back from Egypt, had a massive experience there. And I posed the question, like, what if we were to take away the leading role, the big, the big platform, all the money in the bank? You mentioned fake it until you make it. Does that mean you would own a, the room when you walked in there and you would put on an air around how confident you were. Cause we just talked before we started recording about how you're an introvert and you know, you don't, you're not a natural extrovert. So I'm just, you know, for other people who hear fake it till you make it, what does that actually mean in, in a real world sense? Cause you started yeah. landing these gigs and what did you do differently? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it, there's a, You've heard of like Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, right? You know, there is a certain level of confidence that experience and consistency begets confidence. It just, when you, you go out, you show up, you find your people, you find your opportunities, you, you get the yeses, even if there are a few no's, you get enough of those and you start to really just trust that it's, it's not a reflection of your character or your worth if you don't get it or if you don't land it or if, if you fail, you know? I think there's a muscle you have to build in building that confidence. It's like you don't go to the gym one time, lift a muscle, lift a weight, and like now I'm buff. Like it's microfibers, you know, over years that sh shapes your body. And I just feel like I, I don't I'm a, I'm very risk tolerant. I'm an entrepreneur. I've put myself out there a lot. Uh, and I've just grown to believe that, you know, in who, not just what I'm doing is important, but who I am embodied in who I am. But if I look back at the cheeky girl and like, where did she get her confidence from? Well, she was faking it. I would just say my, my, my passion, like I had an ambition and a drive that was bigger than my um, fear. And that's not to say that I didn't experience fear or didn't feel like an imposter at times, but there was something deeper driving me, I think my whole life that kept me putting one foot in front of the other. Cause it was, that noise was bigger than the noise of the fear. Right. And you also, it sounds like you understood process you were putting in the reps and a lot of it was just coming, coming through that. Plus, with your blog, you had hundreds of thousands of followers, which, you know, you have to be very intentional about very consistent actions in order to grow anything to that size. And when you eventually got to the other side of that and you went broke, that list is still very valuable. So what did you do with that list of hundreds of thousands of followers? Oh, uh, my business partner had it. <laughs> we went through a, a business divorce and, mm. um, okay. That's interesting. What did you learn about that business partners? Oh, and divorces? My, 
Mm, that I never want a business partner ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I no. had the same experience right around that time. Right? I had in return. I was 32, 33. Yeah. It wasn't that bad, but it was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want any more business partners after that. Yeah. I mean, think about it. I often say you're, you know, you create this thing that you both love, but you, but you have different loving styles. You raise, you want to raise it differently. You're not in love with each other but you're in love with this thing you created potentially and you mix in money and strong personalities and different ways of ticking. And, you know, I really, I look back on that relationship with so much, and I know, I'm not just saying this from the bottom of my heart, so much gratitude. Like she was a teacher and it, I, I grew immensely from that relationship it gave me a thicker skin, which you need in business, unfortunately. Like you really have to learn to be discerning and have your, you know, heart protected to some degree. And she, she, she and I are just from different planets. Like there's not, I'm not better than her. She's not better than me. I'm not worse than her. She's not worse than me. We are from different planets. And I really had to, it, space and time really allowed me to see that there was a soul contract there. Um, and I am deeply, deeply grateful. And I, w I wish her so much love and success. Like I, I, I harbor zero um, anger or resentment towards it. But at the time it was brutal. It was bloody. We went through a business divorce. It's like a divorce. And it was over 10 years ago. And I, I really had to do a lot of work on forgiveness um, and I, and I have, and it's, um, did you have now. those tools and this language, this, the spiritual stuff back then? Was there a practice that you had that kind of helped to give you internal perspective or were you just kind of in the deep end of the pool and trying to survive? Yeah, no, I was very blessed. I had a, I had a coach at the time. She unfortunately passed away. Her name was Kirsten. She's my angel now, but she was a very, evolved spiritual teacher that came into my life right at that exact time. And she actually told me to channel in a journal, like from my highest self, what I would say to her. Cause I was really in the 3d like human pain of that experience. And I'll, I'll never forget it. I went to Costa Rica. I was there on like a little mini yoga retreat for myself. And I, was by myself in my introvert, you know, style. And I got out a journal and I channeled this passage that just honored the sisterhood that we had. It was, there was no, it was, it was neutral. It was, it was more than neutral. It was loving. It was of the highest consciousness as to why she and I were really business partners, which had very little to do with the business and more with how our, how and why our souls came together so they could evolve and grow. And I'll never forget that, that passage. And the last thing I'll say too, on that front, when I say forgiveness, um, it wasn't necessarily like forgiving, her, forgiving her for how she treated me. Um, but forgiving for forgiving myself for letting myself be treated that way. It was very, very nuanced around forgiveness and that took some time. And that was a, a practice I only could get through cause I was being supported by some really incredible people. Okay. So you mentioned you took on a corporate job and I think this is something that a lot of people can relate to. You had this corporate job, you're on planes four times a week, you're getting a six figure salary plus bonuses and you're married, right? So obviously you guys are allocating your income to household stuff. And you mentioned in the book, your husband kind of had the scarcity thing around money. And so that was a big deal for you to think about quitting your job. And you also had a story about being bad with money at the time as well. And I posted something today. I said, most risks 
aren't really risks. They just feel like it. Remember, if all fails, you can always return to mediocrity. It will always welcome you back with open arms. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you obviously said you were risks, risks tolerant, but now that there's someone else in the equation. So what conversation do you have to have hmm. in order to, um, in order to honor the other person's concerns your partner's concerns, because now you're married, right? So you just can't really do whatever you want to do without at least running it by the other person, especially if it affects the household income. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking somebody listening to this, who's maybe in that same situation, they want to take the leap of faith. Yeah. They have a great job on paper. Everyone thinks they're successful and they want to do something that may or may not work out. And maybe they yeah. have money, you know, scarcity, money, things happening as well. So just kind of walk us through how, how we can do that. Yeah. So I was working my corporate job. I wanted to quit to start my agency, which was really at the time, a consultancy, a one woman shop. And we got really practical, you know, it didn't make my husband necessarily feel that much better, but I, I, we got out our budget and I said, I will get enough clients before I quit. Like, let me line up some side hustle money before I give my two weeks notice that will equate to enough money to cover my half of the rent because we were 50-50 and groceries and utilities. Like, I will get us enough money. I will make enough money to, to carry my weight in the relationship financially. And I didn't, I kept my word. It took me about a month and a half, two months. Were and you I working got, like five to nine? Were you optimizing those off hours or? Did you I just... was, I was. Yeah. Um, and they were, they were consulting contracts. So they weren't, they were, you know, 20 hours, 30 hours a month. Like it wasn't like a ton of work. Um, and they weren't paying me a ton of money, but I had just enough to prove to my husband, I have a little bit of a cushion here. I'm not totally quitting with nothing lined up. And I will also say, you know, the most non-practical terms, I do believe in the power of leaping and then knowing the net's going to catch you in an energetic frequency, vibrational capacity and choice. You, It's called leap and the net will catch you. Don't tiptoe, don't step. It's like you have to fully bat like both feet need to be in the air. You in need the to air. Any momentum. Yes. <laughs> and because I brought that sense of self-trust and back to what I was saying earlier, I was so passionate about this. I had this fire in my belly starting Simply Be. Those two clients turned to five clients within three months. And then those five clients became 10 clients three months later. And then by the end of the year, I, I had made more money at, at the new entrepreneurial endeavor than I did at the corporate job. And I think my husband, you can't tell your man what to do light. I mean, I don't know if you know that. I'm sure you do. You know, you can't, husbands really don't like to being told what to do by their wives, especially. So I've kind of given up on that with Brian. And instead I'm just the example in action. And that has really been a massive quantum leap for our relationship, frankly. And here we are, you know, I just sold, I sold that business that I started with two clients and as a side hustle seven years later. But also just to be clear, I'm sure, I mean, you know, we hear all about manifesting and you just envision it and it'll happen. You busted your ass at the same oh. time. It almost killed me. That's that's no joke. It I I I was gonna say like I sold it seven years later, after blood and sweat and tears and grind and diagnosed burnout and depression and hustle, you know. And I'm on the other side of that, which is really the inspiration behind the new book. But yeah, it's it is not glamorous being an entrepreneur. It's not easy running a business, being your own boss. Sometimes I'm like, wouldn't it be nice to collect a paycheck every two weeks? What would that be like again? It's true. So you lace your book with all these references to the things that you experienced in Egypt, the temples you visited, the pyramids and all these things. 
How did you remember all of that? Did you Are you a journaler? Do you take notes on a regular basis and write all these little details down, knowing one day you're going to get a book deal and it's all going to be in this book? Or did you already have the book deal and you thought this will be a great experience to add to the book? Well, to answer the first part of your question, I live and die by my notes app on my phone. So I, t I have something called Egyptian magic. It's in my notes app. You know how it saves it in your phone. And it's my, I took notes throughout that whole trip. I, I wanted to record it, not for a book, but for myself. And I actually had worked on the proposal for the light work. Um, I pitched it to my first publisher. They made me an offer, but I wasn't 100% happy with it, but I was considering it. I went to Egypt, came back and tweaked the proposal because I was like, now I know what I really need to say in this book. My agent was pitching the book because I wasn't going to necessarily go with my first publisher. We were exploring our options. And um, I got on the phone with Joel Fatinos at St. Martin's Essentials. And he was just like, I want to know everything about Egypt. I want you to write about that, that trip. I want you to tell me all about the Palladians. That's your message and go for it. And it just felt like the right publisher for this book. He really saw me. And um, I channeled this book in three months. I didn't use AI. I didn't hire a ghostwriter. No shame if you do, but I didn't. I wrote every word and um, it came through me so fast. And I really do believe it's because I got that activated in Egypt. Have you been there, Light? You know, it's been on my short list. You gotta go. And, um, and so... I haven't I haven't been there yet, but I'm fully planning on going there at some point soon. Interesting. You know, you mentioned Skinny Bitch in the book. And uh, I don't know. Do you know Rory Friedman, the girl who wrote Skinny Bitch? No. So it's kind of like this for the, for the listeners. It says, no nonsense guide to plant-based diet. Came out in like the 90s. Yeah. Or, no, it came out in the early 2000s. And she's a friend of mine. And I remember running into her like many, many years later. And that book was like the most Huge. most purchased vegan book in history or something like that. But she would do all these appearances and she had her own sort of transformation. And she said, I just got tired of people expecting me to have the potty mouth and to be cursing. Mm -hmm. She cursed all through her book. Mm -hmm. you know, your, your book is nothing like that. But mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because when when we do present ourselves through a book, it's like people kind of it's like archived and people sort of hold us to that version of who we are. Yes. When that book comes out and yeah. if you have, as you, as you continue to evolve mm -hmm. and that becomes a conversation in your head around how yeah. do I want to present myself now? Totally. I mean, I, I swear less than I used to, frankly. Um, I'm friends with Danielle Laporte. Do you know mm -hmm. who she is? Sure. She's been on this podcast. Yeah, I love her. And um, she was a potty mouth too for a long time. That was like her her brand. And I, connect, I connected with that. You know, I really did. And then she she doesn't swear at all anymore, you know, and I it's part it's it's part of her evolution. And I think that that's a beautiful thing and that we're all on kind of our own timelines, but it's, it's funny that you say that because you know, the process of writing a book, you wrote one, you're, you've, you know, you, your book's beautiful. Um, you write it, it's such a long process, you know? And then, so you, you write the rough draft and then by the time you're at the third or fourth or fifth edit or whatever you, it's a year and a half later and you're a different person than you were when you first wrote it. And I did. I took out a lot of the, I took out a lot of the fucks. It's funny you say that. I was like, this is too much. But I was going to say back to Egypt, it, it, Egypt fucks up your life in the most beautiful way. I'm looking forward to experiencing it, especially after reading your book. I wish I had more like reference points for it just to, cause it's one thing to hear it and read about it, but to be able to kind of see it in your mind's eyes. It's a completely different thing. Yeah. Yeah. But you mentioned brand. Um, and I want to ask you about some of the concepts in the book. Now there's no difference between your personal and professional brand. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? 
this is what my entire business and agency was about. Yeah. My company simply be the company. I quit my corporate job to start freaked my husband out that I grew after seven years was a personal branding agency. So we worked on the personal brands of hundreds of clients. And I just believe that we need to be who we say we are and that there is magic in the mess and that the authenticity of a brand and the magnetism of the brand for a person comes through when you are deeply human and real and that there shouldn't be some nine to five version of yourself and the five to nine real version of yourself that when you integrate your humanity with your professional value, you become you become magnetic. And so that's why I say there's no difference between your professional brand and your personal brand. It's all one and the same. Um, there's of course people who are listening who are like, well, I, I don't want to share my kids on Instagram or there are certain things that are private that don't belong online. And I often say that that's a beautiful choice. You're completely empowered to be discretional and, and write your own narrative and go super specific on the things you want the world to see you as and create that story. It doesn't make it any less authentic if you create things that are, you know, if, if you hold things private, um, you, you're allowed to do that. But I think that when we really look at our personal brand as a sort of, I have, a, this is from my first book, is like a hologram with different pieces that make it light up. Um, what lights you up the most? What is the thing that really gives you fuel that you could talk about endlessly that you are, you could talk about to the day you die because you know the most about it and you're the most passionate about it and make a list of those things and then narrow it down to four because branding is an exercise in clarity, as I often say, and you can't talk about all the things all the, all at once, or you're going to become an expert at nothing and a master of everything. And, um, that to me is, that's, a long-winded answer to that question. I clearly have a lot of feelings and thoughts about it, but yeah, your professional brand shouldn't be different than your personal brand and vice versa, at least in today's world. When you mentioned the light work, we're talking more about what you're here to express. And there's a, there's a flip side to that, which is shadow work, which mm -hmm. is what you've unconsciously repressed. So what's an example of that? of what you've unconsciously repressed? Just like maybe something that you, someone is here to express and what they may be repressing. And is that repression getting in the way of what they're here to express? Or is the expression going to naturally diminish the repression or expose the repression? How, how does it work? Is there, yeah. is there a sequence to it? I have a big philosophy on shadow work. Um, our work you know, on our shadow is, is, is typically looking at our trauma, our pain, our self-limiting beliefs, our shame, um, these things in our lives that have, you know, happened and manifested that we want to like lock away and ignore or just not tend to and, or reject. And I think the first step towards truly consciously expressing the light, which is, I believe is the truth of who you are, the loving, conscious human being who's here to experience everything he or she wants and deserves. Um, we have to go into our dark to face it, address it, of course, heal it. But the way that we do that is by loving it. Um, you know, that to me would be step one is and it's so, it's so confronting, you know, it takes so much self-awareness and humility and self-responsibility, uh, to face those parts of ourselves and we all have them. And when we become unwilling or unconscious of them, if they remain unconscious, they start to run the show and it takes a real honest willingness to hold yourself accountable. Um, and also keep, you know, the commitment and the devotion to the path of your own healing. Um, because I believe our, our, our ultimate reason for being here is to express our light, but we can't, we, we find our light in the dark. Like that's the, the beauty and the 
the pain of this polarizing dualistic human experience. And so um, I tell a, a story in the book about how I had this experience in one of these temples in Egypt where all this dark shit, all this shame, anger, just rage against the machine called my life came up, all my, sh all my shadow that had at least been accumulating for those few years. And we were staying on this boat in the Nile River and I wanted to just get rid of my dark. Like I was like, I'm going to release it. I went back to my little room on the balcony that I had over the Nile River, wrote all of the things I saw in that temple, all the dark shit, and I ripped it up in like a ritual and I like threw it into the Nile River. And I sat down and I closed my eyes and I just heard a voice. I heard my higher self say to him verbatim, she goes, this is, these are not the pieces of you to rip up and discard, Jessica. These are the pieces of you to love. And, you know, I'm on this human experience too, learning that a lot of the same lessons over and over again. But that trip to Egypt was really a um, life-changing experience where I was really able to tap into the depths of my dark to, to really come out of that with so much clarity around my light. Give us a couple more takeaways from that Egyptian trip, because you wrote about it almost like an Egyptologist, right? And we don't want to overwhelm the listener with those details, because obviously we want them to get the book. But what can they come away with that can help them in a real world practical sense yeah. from, from reading these parts of the book about your Egypt trip? I save it very, very clearly at the beginning that the book isn't here to convince you to buy a plane ticket. It's here to show you that you hold exactly what you need in your hands right now, you know, by reading this book and also just in your life, you know, I would say the headline of what I took away from Egypt that I would impart to your listeners, and then we can break it down into practical steps, was that uh, I had missed the memo <laughs> of this human experience and that it's supposed to be joyful. Like it's so amazing to be in a human body, to experience the human life of having sex and eating chocolate and kissing a puppy and wearing cute clothes and traveling the world and living in places like Mexico city, if we feel like it and hosting a podcast because we want to share our voice. Like we live in this beautiful existence and not to bypass it and say that it's not hard at the same time, but we focus on our suffering. I believe more than our pleasure. At least I did. And I came home from Egypt making a radical commitment to joy. And it didn't necessarily look like going and buying cute outfits and traveling to more countries. It was, I'm going to take a walk this afternoon instead of work till five. I am going to go to a local art store and pick up a sketchbook and draw. I am gonna find an ecstatic conscious dance party in my neighborhood and go dance on a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 and move my body. Um, I'm going to read a fiction book instead of a nonfiction book. Like joy, cultivating joy as a practice, as my birthright, uh, which I believe the programming here on this planet conditions us to feel like we have to do something to deserve it. And I just would say Egypt allowed me to take back the debt I felt like I owed to the matrix and um, tap into my highest, highest birthright and vibration, which is joy. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Talk about the divine laws of light. Mm. 
So when I was in Hathor's temple, I got uh, struck by white lightning. And I know that sounds crazy. And one of the things about Egypt, like I said at the beginning or, or a few minutes ago, it fucks up your life. Like it's, it's not a vacation. You know, you go and you have these really wild experiences that sound like you're crazy when you tell them, but that's what happened to me. I was in her temple, the temple of Hathor, who's the goddess of pl bliss and pleasure and joy and fun. And as soon as this white lightning hit me, I started getting all of these downloads. I started hearing the Palladians, Hathor, speak through me. I tell the story extensively in the book. And they shared with me that there are three divine laws of light, truth, information, and love. And information is really the synonym for light. It's according to the Palladian point of view. I've, I've always believed this as long as I've been studying them we as human bodies hold um, light in our DNA. We're made of light. And these trillions of cells store information that in comes from eons of the universe intelligence. And we are literally asleep to that power inside of us. There's We're walking through with the light switch off. And back to your question around dark in like shadow. Shadow isn't dark, evil, wrong, bad. It's just simply lack of information. Truth is your unique expression of your unique blueprint, your DNA, your unique design. It's what you've come here to express fully, unapologetically and authentically. And when we unlock our information, when we realize that we've been in the dark to sleep to our own power, sleep to our own magnificence, we switch on the light, we can, we can express our truth. And um, love is the master lock that unlocks all the keys. I, that's what I call it. The Pleiadians call it the basic building block to the entire universe. It's what we've come here to remember, reclaim, share, express, receive. And earth is school. And we live in a plane where there is the opposite of love. There is a lot of fear here on this planet. And you can turn on Instagram or the news and see that playing out everywhere. And we've forgotten the highest truth of them all, which is love. Love heals all. Love is the answer. Love is um, the the high, just the way. And so the, those divine laws of light came through me in Hathor's temple. And those three elements make up the triangle throughout the book. Um, those three core elements is the light work expressed of information, truth, and love. You also mentioned in the book that we didn't come here to coast. We came here, we came here to get our heart broken, to burn, to fall apart, to grieve. We did. <laughs> Sounds very dramatic. <laughs> well, I know you've experienced all that light. You know this. You know this is why you have your spiritual practice. This is why you're a spiritual teacher, you know, to help people through this human life. And you... I believe we we are students of what we are here to ultimately teach. You know, we have to be. Yeah, and and there, that's why we choose the family we have, and yes, and the people that we are surrounded by. Even though some of those dynamics may be very challenging, because they're actually they're they're curated to help us help us refine and learn what we need to learn. Refine, yeah, mm. yeah. What do you mean by one plus one equals 11? I think that would get red flagged in your basic math class. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we don't well, know the story. Yeah, math has never been my strong suit, but i that is not a mathematical equation, okay? I'll, exp I'll explain. It is a metaphor for be a whole person. So one is you, one is them. It doesn't equal two. You don't you you don't shape shift or you shouldn't I should say morph shape shift bend into a completely different version expression of yourself just by the fact that you've gotten into a partnership. So it's an, a metaphor around romantic relationships. So one plus one doesn't equal two because when you get into your relationship, you shouldn't be unrecognizable to yourself if you were a one metaphorically before you met this person. One plus one equals 11 is the symbol of 
whole people attract whole people. Don't lose yourself in relationships. Be a whole person. Once you get through that relationship, don't lose your identity. And uh, the number 11 is numerically greater than two. It's a greater power number than two. And it's a divine number, you know, 11 um, is we've all, we all know that, you know, 11, 11, we see it on the clock. Like it's a, it's a magical divine number of unity. And um, when I was going through my horrific breakup in my late twenties and healing after a codependent, very addictive, very toxic, hot and heavy kind of situation, I saw that in a, in a newsletter, that, that metaphor. And I was like, I'm going to go get that tattooed on my body. And so I did, and it's on my rib cage. And I got that while I was single. And I met, you know, my boyfriend, now my husband, probably about a year later. I really worked on my wholeness. Um, and I say in my book, just because you're a whole person doesn't mean you're a healed person. You still have to do your work. Um, but there is a difference, I believe, in looking for that relationship, that Jerry Maguire, like you complete me kind of energy versus really standing in your yourself and calling in a partner who stands in their self. It's, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful difference. Awesome. Awesome. Well, a couple more questions. Um, how has your relationship with money evolved? What does it look like today? I talk about this in my book too. And I would, I would say that my money, my relationship with money has completely evolved. Um, I don't, I don't really operate from, from scarcity. I have embodied a different feminine trust around money, a non-attachment to money. I've loosened my grip on money. Um, I sold my business. So that's put me in an, in a, in a position I can, you know, share like, that's a privilege. Um, worked really, really, really hard for that. But, um, one of the biggest things that I never really unlocked until recently was simply the power of receiving. I feel like we, especially as women, are givers, are doers, are exerters. And um, I don't want to sound flippant because this is, this is true. The more fun I have, the more joy and trust and high vibration I have around my work, the more money I make. Um, it's really interesting. <laughs> like I, not to say I, I'm always in that state. I actually had a very tough April. Like I was in a state of constriction and stress and lots of things weren't flowing and neither was my money. And I set the intention at the beginning of May uh, to have fun that I was going to have the most fun this month that I've had all year. And my revenue tripled. Um, it was really interesting. And so not to say there wasn't strategy and, you know, whatever behind that, um, there was, but my energy and my frequency was a match. If that makes sense. And how are you thinking about the concept of success these days? I mean, success to me is, peace of mind is the space to rest is to have enough alone time <laughs> um, while also being able to make a big impact in people's lives. Um, but I have so much sovereignty over what I choose to do in a way that I didn't before. I gave away a lot of my energy because I didn't want to lose the opportunity and um, I've really called that back. And I just, I feel like success is peace. Success is a healed nervous system. <laughs> I love that. Well, obviously you, your work um, caters more to a female audience. And if someone's listening to this and 
they love what you're saying and they want they want more obviously get the book but what are some ways that you did, take us through your 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 funnel like how do people what's the first step someone should do if they want more after reading your books so what's the second step where does it all culminate are they going to yeah. enter a room with you at a retreat or how does yeah. it work I love this question I love you for asking this like you get it um no the the way to really engage. You can go to my website. I have a quiz. You can take my light worker quiz. It'll show you your light worker identity. There are four archetypes. I also have something called the radiance realm. It's a 12 month membership. It's only $197. You get six virtual calls with me all year long, uh, taking you through the book. It's basically like one big national book club and you get monthly drops to your inbox with a extra invitations and keys, meditations, somatic practices, journaling prompts, the whole thing. Um, and a bunch of extra goodies and giveaways and bonuses in that program. It's $197 for the year. I also do retreats. Um, I'm doing another one coming up in January of 2025 in Mexico. Um, I do coaching and then I'm launching a school. I'll give you a preview. Your audience will maybe be the first to hear this. Um, hopefully they do jump into the, uh, the book. I'm hosting a Lionsgate virtual event, August 8th with Michael Beckwith, Koi Webb and, uh, Danielle Page. And we're, um, opening up the portal for 888 cause it's 888. Um, and I'm opening the doors to what's called the feminine frequency business school. And it's a 12 week program and it's a certification on how to become a feminine, uh, divine feminine leader in the world and in your industry. And I'm opening the doors to a brand new way of, of working with me online in an intimate cohort. So lots of different things that I do. And, you know, I'm very grateful that I get to, I, I really call in a beautiful community and I, I just love, I love people. I love women. I love powerful women on a mission to do their, to do their work in the world. And, um, just my favorite thing to to hold more space for them for the, for them to see themselves more powerfully um, through you know through my eyes so love it yeah. well the book is the light work reclaim your feminine power live your cosmic truth and illuminate the world and uh, it's been an honor having you on the podcast Jessica we'll put links to everything that we talked about in the show notes. And uh, we still haven't met. Have we met in person before? No, we, we need to. Yeah. So that needs to happen at some point. I feel like we will soon. We need yeah. to. Yeah. I feel like I've met you and I've known you through yeah. the years, but we'll make that happen. I mean, maybe I'll come. And you, you also are still doing your podcast, right? Yes, I'm doing my podcast. Yeah. I rebranded it. It's called The Spiritual Hustler. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank well, you, you guys have to also check out the spiritual hustler and there's an episode where we flip the tables and I'm the one being interviewed. Um, and you're we such should a link wonderful that in the show notes. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes as well. And uh, yeah. And looking forward to staying in touch. You're a light light. You're wonderful. Oh, thank you. um, your, your work in medicine in the world is so deeply felt and you've been a very, potent teacher to me and a guiding light. And I just love the way you show up in the world. And I know how many lives you, you touch. So I'm very, very honored to have been on your show today. And, you know, I, like I was saying earlier, like one of my, I don't have too many superpowers. I, I, I only have a, a few and I, I, I see people. I just mm. really see people. It's one of the things I, I do. And I see you so clearly and you've been just such a sage wisdom on this planet. And you've given your community so much permission to really drop into the truth of who they are and live from a place of um, peace and simplicity. And I just think it's what we need in the world right now so desperately hmm. and i'm honored to call you a friend thank you that's so sweet thank you very much i received that and again Great. thank you again for for bringing your light to this show 
and sharing your experience. And, and also just, you know, I don't think people realize when you hold a book in your hand, we're, this is, this is a lot of, a lot of work, hours and hours is, well, first you have to have the experience, which means you have to take the leap of faith. It means you have to go through all the drama that, you know, you talked about in the book and kind of figure out a way to make it make sense, organize your thoughts, edit, 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 revise, 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 right? Getting Ugh. a good deal. Um, and then marketing promotions, you get to start several months out and just so much, so many inputs just to have this conversation. And I, I, it's, I'm always just honored that people are doing that and going through that process. Cause again, I know what it takes and it's not, it's not passive at all. <laughs> There's no, nothing passive about not, it. No, it's kind of insane actually, <laughs> yeah. but you know, when you have, like you did, you know, with your book, you have the download and the clarity, even if it it's not all shaped yet to, to do it, it's one of the most beautiful things. Mm. Mm. I, I love writing books and mm. I'm very, very, very grateful that you read it. Like you mm. asked the best questions and you really spent time with it and you know the feeling like there's no better feeling than that so mm -hmm. again <laughs> for honoring that beautiful well thank you thank you again if you like that video you're gonna love the next one click this thumbnail right here and i'll see you over there